This is Radio 4. It's half past six. Heads, it's news. Tails, it's news. It's news. On the hour, such is politics. It's a painful business. On the hour. What you mustn't do in politics is listen to people. It's a painful business. On Radio 4. Such is politics. So that's the door that's open now. Is the Commission worried that it may not be able to kick that door shut again? It is the key that turns the door in the lock to open the door. I want to open doors, not shut them. On the hour with Christopher Morris. Here I am. Take me. Today's top shelf. The headlines. 14 councillors drowned in nosebleed disaster. Queen Thin says man. And the Education Secretary explains why children will now be forced to choose between reading and writing. On the hour. Plus, coming up, Prince Harry and television outbursts against his own father. He's not a god. He settled his power on money, on arms and corruption. And if he's overthrown, I think it will be a good thing. And the police search continues for the gang of inner city youths who are stealing London's car parks. In fact, we're talking about all car parks. Hospital car parks, works car parks, open car parks, closed car parks. If it's a car park, we're interested. But first, the news. President Bush has said that the new spirit of cooperation between East and West will not be altered by yesterday's nuclear attack on Chicago by the Ukraine. The concentrated bombing, which has left large areas of the central United States uninhabitable, was dismissed by the president as an unfortunate incident which should not be allowed to cloud an otherwise encouraging friendship. On the hour. A Home Office report published today has described the standard of homemade weapons in Britain's prisons as laughable. Feeble-minded convicts have been found trying to make guns out of hollowed-out carrots and clubs from glued-together hair. A prison inspector said in regular ingenuity tests, eight out of ten inmates handed a loaded revolver would hammer the barrel flat and try and sharpen it into a knife. Time now for Rosie May with Green Desk. Green Desk. Green News update from me, Rosie May. Sandwiches needn't be the usual fatty bread-based snack. Two green leaves, perhaps with a piece of bread between them, make an interesting and healthy leaf-based alternative. Green Desk. And it's just been announced that the next general election will be on the 27th of March, 1996. With the news in full, here's the continuity announcer. The next general election will take place on the 27th of March, 1996, according to an announcement by the government today. Here's our political reporter, Kevin Toyne. The date announced by the government for the next general election is the 6th of March, 1996. The statement was issued to reporters outside number 10 this morning. The date of the next general election will be the 27th of March, 1996. We've announced the date today to avoid months of speculation. The spokesman said the date had been announced today to avoid months of speculation. But the main parties have already been out sniffing for votes. Leading candidates have been nailed to billboards around the country for unveiling next week. And the image makers have started throwing their oars about with the advertising company Cruz Benson just completing the first party political broadcast of the campaign, which we'll hear in a moment. This broadcast will be sold tomorrow afternoon to the party which offers the most lucre. Here it is in full. <laughs> If your brain was made out of soil and dirt and pus, you wouldn't be able to operate very efficiently. And the same is true when our country is governed by a dirty and pussy political party. Our children are uneducated, and their grazers and scratchers remain untreated. Our youths turn to crime. Riot, kill and eat small dogs and otters, worship the evil Lord Satan and speak when not spoken to by adults. Terrorists destroy our limbs and hair and there is no money. But when we are in power, the sun rises over a misty field as rabbits awake and gently rub their eyes. A party of prospect Everyone has a job which they enjoy and which pays them too much, if anything. Forward with the future time. Industry works properly 
and is the envy of all people of non-English lands. You no longer make foolish grammatical errors and feel comfortable and witty at parties. And a new age of peace and plenty dawns, where all men are brothers. Corn and shoes are regularly supplied by a fleet of solar-powered scooters, and the lost continent of Atlantis rises from the ocean, its ace. I've always wanted to put up, so I'll put up. Well, in, in my line of work, um, I'm an actress, and uh, it just makes a lot more sense for me to vote for them. I'll vote for them. You know, that, that I will. I like them, I'll vote for them. Yeah, I'll be voting for them, because um, I'm left-handed. You can say what you like, but I will vote for them. Hey, I don't know about uh, Easter, I don't know about, about Easter, yeah, but I'm going to vote for them, definitely. And my life's been a complete disaster, so I'm going to give them a go. I don't like them very much, uh, but I'll vote for them. My uncle's one, so I've, I've got to vote for them, really. Vote for us. Tomorrow, today, with the progress of a nation's good workingness. On the Hour, modern yet palatable news presentation. And it's a sobering thought that during that broadcast alone in the 16th century, 300 more children would have died of cholera. Time now for Thought for the Day from Monsignor Treb Lopez. My friends were discussing the snooker in the public house last night. Who do you think is best, Treb? asked Roger. Jimmy White or Stephen Hendry? I think Jesus is best, saith I, quickly. Yes, but just for once, put your bloody religion aside and give us your opinion, said Roger. You cannot put Jesus aside, Roger, said I. Desk. Green news update from me, Rosie May. There's a beached whale vigil in Lowestoft on Thursday night. Please bring a thermos, some flannel and any unwanted heavy lifting gear. Green desk. There's a dandelion seance and daisy meditation in the Cheviots on Sunday. Meet at 2 o'clock by the Cheviots. Green desk. And as part of On the Hour's Nature Awareness campaign, we now invite you to Envire Within. Dr Horace Dobbs is the head of an organisation called International Dolphin Watch. He believes in a global dolphin consciousness and encourages people to swim with dolphins to cure their diseases. Earlier this week, he agreed to go into the BBC studios in Humberside to be interviewed by On The Hour. Dr Dobbs, welcome. Hello. Now, let's establish first of all, what's the difference between a dolphin and, say, a crab? A crab? Well, of course, um, uh, a crab has... Uh, cold blood. A dolphin mm. has the same temperature roughly as human beings mm. and of course a dolphin suckles its young um, whereas crabs of course lay eggs. And, like, a, um, like a chicken. Um, yes. So how did your head first get into the dolphin's realm? Um, well, I used to do medical research in the brain and the central nervous system, and I was interested in psychotropic drugs. Uh, what was the effect of these drugs you mentioned? Um, well, the drugs I was working on were very potent morphine-like drugs. You were working on these drugs? Yeah, right? and this was before right. some of them were 10,000 times as potent as morphine, so three milligrams would knock out an elephant. Mm. Now, we think that one of the things that um, dolphins do is to liberate yeah. um, endomorphines in, in the human brain, and that's one of the reasons why people feel so happy mm. when they see dolphins, and it's almost universal. Let me nail this down. Do dolphins have the answer? Oh, yes. I, I think that, I mean, the, the, I mean, there's no quid pro quo in the dolphin's world. No money at all? Well, no, but I mean, the point is that they, they don't see, the, every, they do things unconditionally. They don't expect anything in return. And I was made aware of this when a lady who couldn't swim came out one day uh, with me on the boat to see a friendly dolphin called Percy. And we hauled her onto the inflatable afterwards and tears flowed down her face. And I said, what did that mean to you? And she said, oh, he gave me unconditional love. He loved me for what was inside me. Fish. Uh, pardon? She may have eaten some fish. Mm. Uh, you know, it depends whether you start looking at this as a scientist, which I was, or a mystic. Which you are. 
Um, well, yeah, that's right. So this means that inside our head we've got mm. pictures and actually mm. have got this sort of mm. global dolphin consciousness mm. which super sensitive mm. people can actually yeah. make contact with. But Maybe. you have to be in a kind of mystical frame of mind. Mm, off your face. And if, we, if you can tune in to the dolphin psyche, as it were, then you start to dance to a merry song. And if you abandon yourself totally to it, then you can find joy. And what would be the dolphin's favourite record? Um, um, I guess tubular bells. Um, but I've got uh, some spheres called celestial balls. And mm. I'm not sure what's inside these things, but if you roll them in the palm of your hand, you get this very soothing, tinkling sound. And they certainly like that. Musical balls? Yeah. Presumably you'd support the idea of crossbreeding between humans and dolphins. Oh, yes. Well, well Ah, well, uh, 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 we've got, in International Dolphin Watch, we've got a lovely video called Oceania, and that in talks about Homo delphinus. And dolphins are not backward in coming forward with their tummy bananas, their tools well, of reproduction. Yeah, they use, they use their penis as a tactile organ, and it's, you know, and it's a very handy thing to tow people around with if, if, if you want to interact with them in that way. And it would be a good idea to get some of their characteristics. Into human beings, yeah, actually. There's, there's no such thing as a nutter in the dolphin world. There appears not to be. On the hour, hard-edged fact while caring for the softer animal. Well, this morning as I sped past the sports room, I couldn't help noticing that Alan Partridge's desk was empty. I thought he was dead until I realised he's at the Olympics. He's there right now for the opening ceremony. Hello, Alan. Yes, the Olympics again, stretching back thousands of years to Greece. Greece, where fit young men wrestled naked under the baking Aegean sun of Mount Olympus. Absolutely naked. Now, once more, we see a new generation of athletes, colossi, giants even, striding with the gelled blonde hair and stomachs like tortoise shells, all ribbed and hard like a sort of rubber wall some sort. Gods and goddesses too, let's not forget. Oh, where did the uh, baby gods come from? Diana of the Hunt. No test tubes in those days, Olympics or not. The Americans here, blonde-haired, muscles rippling under their vests, followed by the Swedish men. Sturdy, blonde, legs like trees, these fellas have got, I can tell you. And the uh, English men next after them, blonde, mostly. Arms like huge, muscly uh, legs. Their singlets and shorts taut with hidden athletic power. All nations here, the peak of humanity, stalking the world of sport as if they had rained from heaven in a golden shower of athletic rain. All of them coming together in harmony at the Olympic feast. The Olympic feast of ancient sport, where they can run around and jump over things, jumping very high into the air indeed, and at what great speeds too, believe you me. And throwing things into the air as well, sort of discs, I think, the throwing. And big balls of iron, like huge walnuts of stone they are, flying into the Olympic sky and uh, some sticks as well. They throw them sometimes. On the hour. Interesting listening with a newsy stamp. And we'll be returning to Alan Partridge at the Olympics later on in the programme. America now, and we've just received this report through the line from CBN's Barbara Wintergreen. What it's about, I've no idea, because I haven't actually had a chance to listen to it yet. A woman's place may be in the home, but from tomorrow it's definitely not in the state of Nebraska. Nebraska Governor Mike Morgan has won Supreme Court approval for controversial legislation banning women from his state. The issue is what kind of America do we want? What kind of America do we want to take into the millennium? Now, we want an America that is strong and full of purpose. And now, when you are trying to make a decision based on strength and strength of purpose, you do not want a woman around. What does your mother think of this legislation? My mother is dead. Your wife? My wife is dead. I'm sorry about that. The Supreme Court ruling paves the way for other states to bring in female clearance bills of their own. And all the signs are that women could be banned from three-fifths of America by the fall. I am wholly in favor of a state for women. Just one. One state would be enough. Which uh, one do you propose? That would be a matter for the Supreme Court to... But not Nebraska. <laughs> Certainly not Nebraska, no. Mother, no. 
nature has disconnected the gender since time Mother of nature is, is a woman. It's an you issue that's divided the USA. Gender. Women's League protester Donna Doubtfire dubs Morgan's legislation geographic gynefascism. It's geographic gynefascism. So what do you mean by that? I mean that men are trying to segregate women into some sort of pen where they have no rights and no bodies and no minds and no future. A woman's body is her own property and she alone should be able to decide its location. Meanwhile, big bucks are being spent on a TV gender fight. Honey. Yes, dear. Get out. Paid for by the American Brotherhood. Senator Morgan says women should get out of the home and out of the state. We say balls. Paid for by the Sisters of America. Can you imagine what I would sound like if I were a woman? I'd sound like this. See? Keep them out. You are running a spike into the solidarity of women by saying that. So it looks as though this is one Supreme Court ruling that very definitely says, wham, ban, no thank you, ma'am. Barbara Winograin, CBN News, in the front line of the battle of the sexes. And we've just received an SOS message. Uh, Mr. Shardick McKenzie has phoned to say that he's lost half his dog. He let her out early this morning, but only the right side of her body came back. He assures us she's not distressed, but says that she has trouble standing upright in a strong wind and has difficulty keeping the food in her mouth. She's a border collie. She was lost near Batchworth Park. Her full name is Patricia Watkins, but if you find just the kins bit on the collar, that's all right. The rest made it back. Time now for Thought for the Day, and our guest speaker this morning is Douglas Hurd. Good morning. Morning to you. I'm depressed. Uh, it's entirely understandable in terms of uh, human nature, but today's whatever it is. Uh, there's a week to go. But the world has always been like that, has it not? Morning to you. This is on the hour, the time just coming up to 8 o'clock on Wednesday, the 16th of July. Good morning from Christopher Morris in London. And good morning from Brian Redhead in Blackburn Cathedral, a step nearer heaven. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the news. Coming up over the next and so on, relief as Matlock is cleared of its dangerous horses. No, I won't miss them. Uh, about four of them came in here, uh, and they knocked that wall down over there and took the video recording. And the environmental nightmare that threatens the beaches of Norfolk. Well, uh, from where I'm standing, from here right down as far as the pier, it's just all yoghurt. Just look at them. They're, those birds are never going to fly again. But first, the news. A consortium of junior Treasury ministers in Strasbourg has agreed on a projected budget deficit for the European community. Joining me now on the line is our deficit correspondent, Peter O'Hanrahan. Peter, what's the atmosphere like now in Strasbourg? Well, it's been uh, an extraordinary day here in Strasbourg. The European junior treasury ministers have come to a historic uh, agreement here on, on budget deficits for Europe in 96. Thanks, Peter. What else? <laughs> The percentages have just been announced. 55% pork belly deficit, 30% cocoa deficit, 30% juice benefit deficit. Making 115%. Correct. 115 out of 100. Yes. Percent means out of 100. You've just given us 115 out of 100. How do you I get know. that? I didn't get it, Chris. Well, you've got it written down in front of you. Yes, you've I just have. read it out. Yes. How does it work, then? How can you get 115 out of 100? The, that is the European way. All right, you can, just, you can just sit there in Strasbourg and tell me how it feels as you cruise casually past a finite barrier like 100 out of 100 it's towards 101, 102, 103, and God knows 115 it doesn't go out of 100! It doesn't go beyond 15. It won't go any further. All right, carry on. It's the thin end carry of a on. very, very, very complex wedge. What do you mean, a complex wedge? Comple I've got the wedge in front of me. I can see it, and it's complicated. Surely a wedge is a simple triangular device causing a split. Not necessarily. OK, tell me how complex this wedge is. It's got wires on it. How do they help? They're all different colours, and they connect. Each one represents a different nation. <laughs> Peter. Yes, Chris. I'm not the only person who's becoming increasingly annoyed with your rather tedious, louche style. I'm sorry. Don't say anything more! I can't stand your sniffing! <sighs> Peter, thank you.
I said thank you. Oh, I, I thought that meant I could go. Peter, thank you. Just... Thank you! On the hour. A sensible broadsheet among the brightly coloured rubbish. Now, Saturday mornings wouldn't be the same, would they, without the zap and tinkle of Radio 4's hot air. The chat unit who make the programme have supplied us with this special package featuring all the bright young things of the hot air team, led, as ever, by 60s satirist Dan Dandy. Uh, hello, and first today's noise. The sound of a hammer banging on a table made from wood from a Viennese church next to which stands a forge which fashioned the hook from which hangs the print of a hall in New York which once held a concert of music by Stephen Sondheim. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. uh, round the table we have three regulars, four irregulars, two old irregulars, four new regulars, three old, two news, five very old indeed, plus the oldest of them all, Richard Sox. Uh, though of course, Richard, you are in fact not old at all. You are extremely young, uh, being a trendy and fashionable uh, style guru. Uh, what have you been up to this week? Well, this week yes. I woke up with a question in my head. Splendid. Paper. Yeah. What pa is paper? Uh, paper. God. God. Yeah. God. Really good. God, God, God. Yeah, God. I mean, God. yeah, we all use it, but do we actually know what it is? Play my tape. Paper, 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 paper. I knew I could only get a decent answer by asking the people in Carnaby Street. It is only a paper, 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 paper. You look at that, right? Yeah. What actually is it? it... Paper. On the paper! On the paper! On the paper! But what is paper? Documentation. That's quite a sophisticated answer. Do you work in advertising? No. Can you give us a voiceover? We're flying out like endless rain into a paper, 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 paper cup. What is paper? Basically, it comes from trees. Yeah. Which is the problem uh, with the rainforest and the ozone there. So that's quite a trendy answer. Well, not quite. It was trendy 20 years ago. Yeah. So it's quite it's modern. 20 years ago, they were still talking about it. Yeah, this. but it is trendy! And the paper, 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 paper. Well, if the people on Carnaby Street couldn't help me, I certainly didn't hold out much hope in asking the manufacturers of paper. I mean, after all, they're just normal, everyday people. Everyday people! I mean, it's amazing, isn't it, to think of these rows of ordinary people spending every day of their working lives making paper without ever actually knowing what it is. You make paper, don't you? Yes. Yeah? What, what is it, then? Well, basically, the fibres of trees taken and treated in such a way as to split the ends open. Uh -huh. um, from there, this will carry on to the paper-making machine itself, which applies a slight shake, uh -huh. uh, which in turn would cause these fibres to overlap each other and intermingle. Um, we then add china clay to the mix, which fills in the hills and valleys caused by this intermingling. As you come through to the other end of the machine, there is the paper. So you don't actually know what it is? How do you mean? On the hour, choice morsels from a broad kitchen. The time is nine quarter seventy to a fifth width of three. Public schools now, and of course by the term public school we mean private school, as Evelyn War so wittily pointed out in his book. Kevin Smear has been prodding the jerseys of the educationally privileged. His report was actually recorded at Chapter House, though you can take it as read that it's pretty applicable across the board. Chapter House, a public school deep in the rolling heartlands of Sussex. But in John Major's classless Britain, ho, 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 what place public schools? What goes on there? Who gets hurt? John Peterson is the headmaster. What do you say about these accusations that there's a lot of bullying going on in your school? Yes, of course it goes on. Um, it goes on in society, and we are a microcosm of society, and, and bullying is all part of the, the natural order. Of course we don't want boys to be um, maimed or, or hurt in any sort of undue or, way. Or, for example, killed. Uh, I believe there was a death in the school last month, a David Duckins. Presumably, someone got punished. Well, Duckins was punished, of course, posthumously. There, there might be some people who, who would like to ask the question, why was a dead boy punished? 
It was nothing specific, but his character was afflicted by the nonce syndrome in that he was a bit of a mincer. He affected a rather lax, unupright disposition and uh, was seen very, very blatantly mincing along the corridors. We can't right. have this. You've got to understand that if anyone finds out that I talk to you, I could get scragged. 13-year-old Lionel Cosgrave, a poor boy at Chapter House on a poor boy scholarship. We met secretly in a shed where they keep the school hurdles. His story was a battered one. All right, all right. Go well, on, no. No, go no, on. No. yes, it'll go, go on. It'll go no further. No. This isn't switched. No. 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 I've been varnied, like, twice at the front and uh, once at the back, and uh, once they even varnied me uh, in the toilets. Tell me more. All right. Um, sometimes, right, they, they, they come out of classes, like, the teacher just says, no more classes, Lionel's outside, they all come out, right, and they strip me naked, they scrag yes. me from behind, yes. scrag me on top, they then take me out into the refectory, they give me a good throw pull, and then take me back and scrag me again. You poor boy. Square bashing, queer bashing, non-spashing is all part of the curriculum. There is community service for... The pufters, that's fine. We, 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 of course we're going to provide something for them because they're not going to be any use on the battlefield. The school, I believe, has, has bought a young French girl of 17, I think. Yes. Maria oh, yes. Enou. Yes, Maria the Tart, the French Tart, because, of course, I don't want boys being distracted by each other. There's a lot of kind of monkey business goes on in the showers and I certainly don't want to condone that. And so what we do is we use this woman, this girl, to uh, initiate them. So she, uh, we get our money's worth out of her, you might say, because she she's really does work round the clock. I sat in on a Chapter House school staff meeting. Uh, I, I'm worried about Smythe, uh, as we're talking about the play, that he seems to be taking the part of Cordelia rather seriously. Yes. I also think that uh, Maria could, co could pop in uh, one tea time and just give him a, you know, a chat and, and some, you know, some physical... Uh, I don't know. I'll uh, give him a, a scene too, if you like. He's um, uh, different. Different uh, he, in what way, Maria? Uh, yeah. I don't know. The, um, Do you mean he's a puff? It doesn't seem to be very manly, uh, really. Uh, His father's a musician, isn't he? Should we have him bashed by the uh, older boys? I think one bashing might sort him out, just the one. I think, I think it would have to be a pretty damn big bashing, though, in front of the whole school. Naked? Oh, well, yes, yeah. obviously. So. Chapter House. A charnel house. And your reporter on that piece about schools was... Um, just time now to uh, whip back to Alan Partridge before the end of the programme. He's at the Olympic opening ceremony. Alan, loose your bow. There are flags here from many countries, all different colours, and people of all different colours like the flags, though the people, of course, are not always the same colour as their flags. Maybe they should be, who knows. Now, and in the athletic parade now, I can see some of the women athletes, a relatively uh, new development these women are, and, and I know, you know, some people say, no, they shouldn't be here, not in the Olympics, no, let them, let them uh, have their own Olympics like the uh, disabled uh, fellas do, but I say no to them. I think it's good to have them along, adding a bit of glam to these sacred races in their uh, shorts. Very nice, very nice indeed. There's the Moroccans from Little Morocco. Look at the cheeky fellas, the smaller racers coming together, competing with the big boys. I wonder what their national anthem is. Uh, probably quite a lot of drums involved. Pity we uh, probably won't be able to hear it here because uh, I doubt, frankly, if they'll be winning anything. Unless, of course, they're giving out medals for pluckiness. Closing music. And just time for a swift toke on tomorrow's headlines. Kleenex-fingered man, too flappy for yacht, says Skipper, that's the independent. Fast-selling pick-me-up distilled from dead gymnast, the star. Inside tomorrow's Financial Times, by the way, you'll find a free football. Ashamed by your mistakes in architecture, the Madrid Monthly. And demented raccoon prized from Cartland's headless corpse. That takes up most of the front page in The Guardian. That's it. 
I'm Christopher Morris, and remember the saying, no news is good news, it's balls. Written permission from Andrew Glover, Stephen Wells and David Quantic. Horizontal lettering stitched by Stuart Lee and Richard Herring. Studio production was by Armando Iannucci and Chris Morris. And the news editor was Armando Iannucci. Well, those outrageous comedy stars of the American movie Wayne's World, Mike Myers and Dana Carvey, are Terry Wogan's guests on tomorrow's Wogan Show. And Terry also meets Normski, the hit presenter of Dance Energy House Party. BBC One tomorrow at 7.